So now it's perfect timing to bring in our VIP guest to officially launch this project. Now this was a great and wide ranging chat. We covered a lot of bases as you'll hear. But just to avoid confusion, I should tell you we recorded this over Zoom a couple of weeks ago before the Wales-Scotland match and while we were all still celebrating Scotland's win at Twickenham. So here she is, the patron of, among other things, the Morden Foundation, the Equine Grass Sickness Fund and, indeed, the Scottish Rugby Union. Princess Anne, the Princess Royal. Your Royal Highness, welcome. Welcome to our own farm, Food, Agriculture and Rural Matters podcast. It's an honour to have you aboard. Just, I uh, suppose, before we get started properly, um, what about the game at the weekend? The Calcutta <laughs> Cup coming home. Yes, that was quite an achievement, wasn't it? And I'm given, I mean, oddly enough, I was thinking, well, that's, that's not much to do with Morden, but of course, John Jeffries has been much involved in Morden, and Doddy Weir is a farmer, and lots of them were in, in the old days. Many of them would have known exactly what Morden did. So maybe that's not such an unlikely step. There would have been a lot of shouting in the borders, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you're actually, you mentioned him. Um, you're now the highest profile guest that we've had on On Farm. But I think, um, I don't know if you're aware, we had uh, Doddy Weir. He was probably the, he's now the second highest profile guest we've ever had. <laughs> but just just mentioning him, I don't know if you were also aware, the, the Calcutta Cup, that marked the culmination of the Doddy Aid Challenge, which was set up by Rob Wainwright. Yeah. Yeah, and 27,000 people from all over Scotland, plus some exiles, they walked, they jogged and they ran. They managed to clock up two million miles over the six weeks and they've made over a million pounds for MND research. So I don't know, what what, what do you make well, of that? Well, I mean, I think Doddy has been such an inspiration and sadly that probably would have been true of almost anything that he did in terms of uh, charity fundraising. But the fact that it's happened to him and he is so much at the forefront of getting the message across about what a cruel disease it is, and not just for him, but for everybody around him. I think the response just says it all. I mean, the, the level of understanding and and the fact that he has been so positive about it and he's already, let's face it, passed the, um, the targets that he'd set himself. So he's keep, a bit of a challenge to keep on setting himself some more targets, but I'm sure he'll find something. Yeah, I mean that that I think they're at something like eight million pounds or something his foundation has raised and and that particular effort a million pounds in six weeks. I mean, I just think that that personally I think that's amazing. And I think, you know, from 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 our end of the podcast, I think we should I'm saying thank you to everyone who took part. I would. I think um Rob, who I meet quite often, has been a, a real driver of this. Mm. Um I can go so far as to say he's completely obsessed with the, the amount of exercise he takes, but he they both do it very constructively. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So long as they remember, of course, that dog walking is for life. It's not just for Doddy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in the, with, for the dog's gaze, yes. Yeah. Although I must admit, I, I saw somebody jogging past the other day with a, a rather elderly terrier. I'm entirely sure the terrier was enjoying it quite as much as his, his owner was. <laughs> now... Ma'am, obviously, you know, I, I did. I brought up the rugby, as you say, there's connections with Morden, but I, I brought the rugby up because you're, you're patron of the SRU. But amongst other things, you're also patron of the Royal Highland Education Trust and the Morden Foundation. Um, and I just wondered, what, what does it mean to you to be involved with these, what I would say, treasures of Scottish agriculture? Well, I think that if, for me as an individual and also as a farmer, I, I find the way that they do business transforming what ha can happen in farming, particularly livestock, but also transforming the educational, the transfer of information to as many people as possible has been a real encouragement. And others do do it from time to time, but I think they've been perhaps the most effective organisations that I've come across in that area, both bringing together the science, bringing the whole picture together. So it's not just a single subject area, which I think is a big danger today. Not surprisingly, given the amount of knowledge available, that you know, things tend to go down very separate routes. Yeah. But for yeah. farmers and for education, you somehow you've got to bring that together. So there's the whole picture is still in front of you. And I think both organizations managed to do that really well. I, the the Morden in particular, you know, um set up in 1920, obviously 
unable to properly celebrate the centenary last year. But you know that that organisation was 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 set up. I, I take my hat off to the sort of farmers who set that up who decided they had an issue, um, didn't know what the answers were, and, and actually brought scientists on board. And they had the foresight to do that. And it's continued along those lines, hasn't it? Farmers working with scientists. Yes, and perhaps the key to that, I mean, it might not have been so strange that farmers would want to have more information. But in the Morden's case, they maintained that ownership uh, of the subject alongside the scientists. So they've always kept, you keep coming back to the practical, you keep coming back to what is actually going on on the farm. Instead of saying, oh, well, we've cracked it, we've got the vaccine, they'll move on to something else. And when we know with Lauping Hill that that changes, and sometimes you go back to where you were before and you have to start again. Yeah, yeah. Bring the lab out onto the farm and then keep the communication going both ways. Um, so regular listeners, they'll, they'll be aware that we published a, a mini series of four episodes from um, Morden and we looked at Lauping Hill, as you say, and we looked at a lot of the farm animal stuff. But for this episode, um, our thoughts are turning to equine disease, specifically equine grass sickness. Um, and ma'am, you're, you're also patron of the, the, the Equine Grass Sickness Fund, which is a, a charitable effort under the Morden umbrella. I wonder if you might just give us an insight, please, into this disease and what what you know of it. The weird thing is that I know we see a lot more of it on the Balmoral estate now. I don't remember ever seeing it as a child. So there's something that's changed. And yet, when I was competing, and we used to come up to Scotland to um, two or three competitions up here, we were always warned not to let the horses graze because grass sickness was rampant in Scotland and it was considered to be something that you didn't see anywhere else. And yet the history of grass sickness goes back to the early days, to the origins of the modern. So it's, it's an old disease, but it's been unbelievably difficult to pin down. And here we are a century later, and we're still going round some of the boys again to see if there isn't something more we can more information we can get out whether we can identify where those areas of weakness are that make it possible for grass grass sickness to appear it is still a seriously difficult disease to get a grip on and i hope this new um fellowship research fellowship will encourage people to to understand just how important it still is. Yeah. So as you say, you've been, you've been around horses all, all your life and, and you have personally come across grass sickness then. Yes. More so recently at, at Balmoral where they've had quite a lot of uh, losses, sadly. And that's, you know, particularly when you're breeding Highland ponies and you lose two really nice colts and, you know, one go- that's a pretty devastating impact as well as the fact that they are working ponies. Yeah. It's important to keep those gene pools um, yeah. Yeah. relevant. Absolutely. And it, it's obviously, it's, it's sudden and there's nothing you can do and it's, it's devastating. The, the nothing you can do is an interesting one because, of course, I've seen the other side of that at the DIC as part of their efforts to get a treatment. And in the end, if you ask them the question, you know, what makes the difference? It, it, it appeared to be nursing care. Okay. So it was giving horses the confidence somehow to go on living, because frequently, and you may have seen this, I mean, well, nothing quite like sheep and their ambition to die, but um, (laughs) there are other animals who give up quite quickly, so they need support. And interestingly, they said that they thought nursing was almost the key to their survival, but beginning to understand how to keep the gut active and, and what to treat it with. Yeah, yeah. I think that's been... Really interesting. And the speed at which you can diagnose will help th- those survive better. Today, I think today this podcast is is basically hopefully marking the start of a fight back against grass sickness. We're basically we're launching a new campaign and, and it's about helping to fund this new multidiscipline research program at Morden. Um, and it's all about finding answers because you know there, there aren't really any answers and and we don't you don't know quite why this happens so you know we're on zoom today ma'am but can i ask you just to say a few words to launch the fund and maybe reach across zoom and cut the ribbon and open the little curtains on the plaque (laughs) (laughs) well I, I, i suppose that would make very good sense from my perspective i mean every time i go to the morden 
I catch up with the uh, grass sickness um, research, but there is no doubt that it all it always needs that little extra uh, kick, a little that extra momentum and funding to hopefully make that that a real step forward. And I think that this um, for more than to you know launch a research fellowship as part of its centenary and to choose to do so with grass sickness is pretty significant given their history and background and success in so many areas um, with livestock and diseases. So I'm, I'm delighted to launch that, the new research fellowship for equine grass sickness at the Morden. And I hope there'll be lots of people who'll be interested, <clears throat> apply for it and fund it. I know that over the years, I have heard potential, if not cures, I, uh, I, the ability to identify what might cause it. And yet none of it ever seems to quite come to fruition. There was even a period uh, when I think they identified a disease in hares in uh, the east of England, okay. which were very similar to grass sickness. And they hoped that that would help identify. But that kind of petered out. And it's the the problem is to maintain the continuity of research, and I hope this will help very much to do so. Absolutely, because this is all about, my understanding anyway, it's all about bringing together um, scientists from, from across the discipline. So, you know, soil scientists as well as equine veterinary people. And it's not just looking at the, the horse in isolation, it's the environment and, and the soil, etc. as well. Well, they've certainly... Um... Perhaps they focused on on a, a couple of areas of time of year, grass flushes. Whether that's so, that's to do with the weather, and that could come at any time. But there are certain periods when those conditions appear to make grass sickness slightly more likely. So it's that it's soil, it's grass, temperature, state of the horse, its immune system, and the. And we really do need to get as much information from every part of that equation. So for horse owners in particular to be very aware of the situations their horses are in, the type of fields they're in, you know, what has happened in, um, in weather terms, perhaps what was there before, all of those observations will make a difference. And yet you need scientists from a whole range of different specialties to help bring that information, see if you can sift out the key, uh, which makes it either feasible for horses to develop grass sickness or, or inevitable, maybe, that they'll develop grass sickness. So I, I guess, actually, what we're really looking for is, you know, as you said earlier, um, Morden's key is farmers working alongside the scientists. So for, for this, we're really hoping that um, that horse owners could work alongside the scientists and, and help both sides to understand what's going on out there in the field, as it were. Certainly that. I don't think we'll make any more progress unless we bring the whole range of information together, but particularly where the animals are and what the conditions were as soon as you possibly can. And so that you have that information to go with the holes. What sort of grass lay you have may be relevant, but in a lot of places where these horses are, there is no grass lay. It's just the grass. Yeah, and I, yeah. that's the tricky bit. It's been so difficult to identify a real common denominator across the cases of, of grass sickness. It's, it's not in any way, as my understanding, it's not in any way, you know, genetic or, or more prevalent in certain breeds or types, is it? It's just cross-cutting, isn't it? I think it's, it's across all breeds. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think if you said it was more prone to ponies in Scotland, that would be because there are more ponies in Scotland in, yeah. in those places. So I yeah. don't think that's relevant. Ma'am, you've you've mentioned ponies there, and I know that you're you're patron of another um, organisation that's quite close to my own heart as well, um, the Pony Club. I just just wonder what what do you think that young people um, and I guess older people too get out of being with and around and and actively involved with horses and ponies. I think you know the pony is the key to this. It's in the enjoyment of being with an animal. And the adventure, the excitement that goes with it, because you can't be around horses and ponies. There's always an element of risk in anything you do with them. And it kind of sharpens youngsters' interest and in just I mean, get become more active. It, it adds a degree of responsibility 
to them and to their lives, which perhaps they don't get in any other way. I mean, everything else has been, you know, you reduce youngsters' responsibility for their activities. But I think with, if you're going to be involved with ponies, you have to have that responsibility because otherwise you're fundamentally unsafe. I know from the Riding Disabled Association that the, the benefits that your parents and carers see is something that they find sometimes very surprising in terms of confidence and the way they behave. And uh, that's, that, I think that works across the board. But being outside, let's face it, is, is perhaps the, the key to the enjoyment. Pony Club does add a bit of discipline, I think. Is that still true? You've got more local, <laughs> more recent knowledge than I have, yeah. I think. <laughs> I, might have to, I might have to ask um, Susanna, Emily, Rosie, James, Scarlett, all, all the younger ones at the Lauderdale Hunt branch. Um, yeah, I think it's what's, what's the message? Heads up, heels down and kick on, I think. Yeah. I think so. If in doubt, kick on. <laughs> <laughs> um but I, I guess on that, you know, they're all. I, I suppose to be tr- to be truthful, they are they're all struggling a little bit um, because of lockdown and yeah. you know, and, and again even the, even the weather. But you know, they're not they're not doing their usual pony club um, activities. So maybe do we need to give a, a few words of encouragement and motivation to? It's it's not going to last forever. This well, it isn't going to last forever. And and if you've got ponies, you can't stop d- working with them. Um, they don't do furloughs and, and <laughs> isolation very well. Um, you've got to stay involved for their welfare. And I worry a bit about the sort of um, understanding of the impact that uh, lockdown has on those animals that uh, we have care of and responsibility for. In the summer, we got away with it because you could chuck them out in a field and it was reasonably okay. In the winter, not okay, because unless you've got the capacity for having a reasonable field to put them out in the winter. And even then, you're not going to be able to leave them out. The conditions that you've got at the moment, no, there are very few, unless they, they are literally wild ponies who will cope with that. And that sort of attempt, you've got to be able to maintain that activity. But that is part of the responsibility. There are lots of other ways of learning, as we've all discovered, and your podcasts, I'm sure, have contributed to that. It's interesting because, um, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think... Just having that um, responsibility does help, and and our, our girls are out there, you know, helping to get ponies ready and helping to muck out stables and what have you, because we're obviously got them in at night at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I think you're right. It it it's it's it helps it helps the young ones, and I, I just hope that we can get back to some pony club normality in the nearest future. That would be good. Yes, that would that would be good for everybody. I, I think. I, I I I should tell you the story. So Bobby Charlton said to me many years ago, he said, uh, my daughter's interested in horses. And I rather apologised. I said, you know, I'm unlucky. <laughs> and he said, don't ever apologise for horses. He said, I was so grateful that all through her teenage years, we knew exactly where she was. And she was either out with the ponies or she was in and asleep. And that went right through her teenage years. The whole family had to get involved. He said, I had orders, you know, the weekends when we went to shows. He said, I had to bring the picnic. He said, we all had our job to do. It was all part of the family experience. And I really thought for somebody who'd never been involved with equines in any shape or form, that was quite a telling comment and and better than asking somebody like me who grew up with them and assumed that they would be there. But he had worked out the advantages of, of having the animals as a, a part of your sort of sport life. Yeah, I suppose in a way it, it actually rolls out onto the, the farm that as well. You know, I'm I'm so so glad, it, it, I suppose, especially in the current circumstances, lockdown, etc., that our girls are being brought up here on the farm and they've got the sheep to distract them and, you know, and, and as, as, as an interest outside and, and obviously the ponies. So, yeah, you're right. Animals do have that um, way of, yeah, bringing people together and as a family, and, and we all we all muck in and get on with it, as it were, muck in, muck out. Yeah, and I have to say that we are lucky if we're living on a farm. I mean, in lockdown, you know, we really are lucky. I mean, it may be inconvenient, there may be things that we can't access, but compared to those who live in urban areas or mm. in what seemed at the time like a very convenient flat, whoa, not an attractive proposition, and yeah. really difficult to deal with. 
especially yeah. if you've got children. Mm. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, and I, and I I I do count our blessings. It's it's maybe not quite so surreal and, and and difficult this time around in lockdown, but certainly the the first time it was, you know, we were lucky compared with a lot of people, and I I, I do I count the blessings for that. Um, Although it was difficult for the modern, it centenary year obviously changed, but it has a role which can't stop. Yeah. And all those elements of research it's involved with are to deal with livestock. None of that stops. Yeah. And it, it's difficult when people think, you know, if you become so focused on, on one particular uh, aspect of life, to lose the sense, the important sense of what's going on in uh, places like the modern, and that's still just as relevant for the future. But, of course, you'd be very aware, Your Royal Highness, that... Um... Morden has also been involved in, in, in the fight against COVID, in processing tests. And I believe that the, that the setup lent itself to processing large numbers of samples in the same way as they would with, with livestock disease samples. You know, whereas in human medicine, we're used to one sample coming in for one person and it goes under, you know, it, it's, it's processed in a different way. And, and I think the Morden has, has really, as someone said, actually, it was a great, sort of marker for the centenary to be able to do that, to, for the foundation to be able to do that. Yes, and, and of course the Morden's history in terms of uh, developing vaccines and, in, and infectious diseases, there was a huge amount of experience there in both handling and the direction in which you, the research needs to go. They have survived and done very well. The Animal Health Trust um, down in Newmarket used to do the same with equine flus, they did not get any support. They no longer exist. And yet they'd had exactly the same skill set and had been researching flus ever since they started. That's 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 a very interesting point. And that actually does, you know, it does bring us back, I guess, to the to the equine grass sickness and and the fact that, you know, we, we have to all support these initiatives and we have to all support this work and we have to support the likes of Morden, otherwise we may be in danger of losing them. Well, we're certainly in danger of losing what is really important continuity of study on diseases which evolve. You can't help thinking that that, from the human's perspective, is going to be really important in, in the future because some of these animal diseases have given us a really firm base to work from because of that continuity of, of research and developing vaccines to go with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Your Royal Highness, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been absolutely great to speak to you today here on On Farm. And I hope that this is a, an episode that really raises awareness of, of the disease, of the work that's happening at Morden and of the fund. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for, your, for taking the interest. Hopefully that will generate all the information people need to know about grass sickness and hopefully encourage not just support for this grass sickness, but for support for the research fellowship as well. So thank you very much indeed. I'll leave it at that and say goodbye. Her Royal Highness there, ladies and gentlemen, Princess Anne. Definitely the highest profile guest we've had yet on On Farm. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we're going to top that, but of course we will try. This is on farm. <laughs>